Hi everybody, and welcome to my first of two videos introducing the Minolta SRT-102. This was the best camera that Minolta made in the SRT series. It uh, has a lot of bells and whistles and there's a lot to it. And it's incredibly useful and well built and well thought out. So let's start taking a look at this. This is an interchangeable lens SLR, which simply means that the lens can come off of the camera and a different lens or the same one can be put on, put back on. It has a light meter. Uh, I actually couldn't find out anywhere, and I don't know why I couldn't, why I couldn't find this, what kind it is, but I believe that it's an averaging meter um, and it has provisions for extended capabilities and high contrast settings. That's what, uh, if you look on the bottom of, of, your, of your prism, it says CLC right there. And that's what that means, contrast something or another. I forget the exact, exact meaning. Uh, so it has the provisions for, for high contrast settings, but I believe that it is an averaging meter inside of it. It has shutter speeds of bulb and one to one thousandth of a second. When you look through the viewfinder on the back, it magnifies the image uh, by 0.9x, which simply means that the image is 90% of the uh, image size that is going to be on the film plane, uh, on the film when it records the image. The viewfinder also covers 95% of the frame, which is really good. But what that means is that you have about two and a half percent of the frame on any given side that is going to appear on the on the image that you won't see on the viewfinder and that's all right it's always better to have more on the on the image than you can see anyway it has a non-interchangeable split ring focusing screen and we'll, we'll see that in the second video what the focusing screen looks like in it and uh, but it's not interchangeable like some of the other cameras like the Minolta XK and, and other competitors cameras and it has a flash sync to the hot shoe and the PC port here at 1 60th of a second. And you can see on the shutter speed dial that 1 60th is red, indicating that's your flash shutter speed. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in the second video and how to use your flash. Uh, so if you want to skip to the, if you, that's what you're interested in, you can skip to the second video. And in both of these videos, there's an index. So if there's a specific topic you're interested in, just check out the description and you can find the index there. So let's talk a little bit about this camera's history. Its target market was advanced or professional users. Uh, professional users would have this as a backup body, probably to the Minolta XK, uh, which was a more professional grade system camera. But the SRT-102 is a very robust camera that provides a lot of really good capabilities. So if for some reason their XK's battery just died or the shutter jammed or they just needed to use a second camera while their assistant filled, filled the first one with film, then this was a pretty good backup body. It was succeeded, it, this was uh, the camera that succeeded the SRT-101, which was then the flagship camera and was uh, relegated to being second fiddle uh, to the SRT-102 when it came out. And they're largely the same. The SRT-102 has a few added features, for instance, this bevel on the prism, which allows you to see the, the aperture number on the focusing ring. It has a switch to switch between flash ports instead of having two. And I think those were the two major differences. Uh, the SRT-102 was second only to the XK in other markets. It was called the XM or X1 in terms of camera quality and features. And Minolta names their cameras different things in every market. So the XK is the same as the XM and X1. The SRT-102 is the same as the SRT Super in Japan or the SRT-303 in, in Europe. Minolta produced the 102, the Super or the 303, whichever you want to call it, from 1973 to 1975 in Japan. So it had a fairly short runtime before it was superseded by the 102, uh, I'm sorry, by the SRT-202. So it was preceded by the 101 concurrent with the XK-101 and 100. The 101 
was produced for an extremely long time. And then it was followed by the 202. And also of note, when they produced the 102, there was a production, there were some production differences. Early 102s have this little switch right here, which we'll look at in just a second. Later 102s do not. So if you have your camera or the manual, let's take a look at it and we'll go over the features. And we'll start, even though these are technically on the front, we have the strap lugs right here. And that's where you attach your camera strap. Here we have the film rewind knob and lever. This is what you use to rewind the film. And if I have no film in there, I don't think I do. Good, I don't. Open up the film back. Uh-oh. Here we have the company's making mark, flash hot shoe with X sync. So as you can see, there's only one contact on the flash hot shoe. And what that means is that the flash can control the, the camera can control the flash at, uh, at its full power. It does not have the capability to communicate uh, data to the flash about metering or to receive information from the flash either. Here is this little red mark. That is your film plane indicator that lets you know where the film is if you're taking exact, very exact measurements for things like macro photography. This is your shutter speed adjustment dial. And if you lift and rotate, you've got your ASA adjustment or ISO as it's called now setting dial. Film advance lever. Film shutter button. Serial number, frame count window. The frame count window automatically resets when you open up the back and helps you keep track of where you are in your roll of film. Going now to the camera's front, over here we have the self timer lever. Then this is the depth of field preview button. And what it does is as you're looking through the viewfinder to compose your image, it will stop down the lens so that you can get an idea of what your depth of field is going to be. And one of the very nice features about this is it's a two-touch system. Most manufacturers, in fact, every other camera I've ever used, as far as I can re remember, you have to hold the depth of field preview down, button down in order to see it. With this one, you push it once and then push it a second time to undo it. And that's an incredibly intuitive and well thought out feature. Here we have the lens mount. This is the lens mount here. We've got the shutter inside. We've got linkages to communicate uh, aperture data uh, between the lens and the shutter in terms of stopping down and opening up the aperture. Here we have the meter coupling pin. This allows the lens to communicate the aperture setting to the camera so that the camera can correctly compensate uh, in the light meter to allow you to meter your image properly. The red dot's just your index so you can line up your lens properly to mount it. There's a little window there that allows you to see the aperture number on the lens. You can see the numbers right there. As you're looking through the viewfinder, and so you will know what your aperture setting is going to be. This is the lens release button right here. Here we have the flash PC port. And this is a switch to switch between X and FP. For all intents and purposes today, you'll just leave it in X because FP flashes use bulbs. You can't get the bulbs for them anymore. And any flash you would go into the store to buy today is an X flash. So there's not any, really any reason to switch it to FP anymore. The last one we're going to do a little bit out of order is this knob right here. And that's because not every SRT-102 has it. That is the MLU button, or dial, or knob, whatever you would like to call it. And what it does is lock up the mirror so that you can take images such as macros and things like that with relatively little camera shake, or actually none, that's coming from the mirror. Try that again. So there you can see the mirror is locked up. And so when the mirror is locked up, you can't see through the viewfinder, obviously, because it's, it's blocking the viewfinder and everything is black. But also, if you take a self-timer shot, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to use mirror lockup in the second video, but it's good for self-timer shots, and it's good for uh, long duration shots where you don't want to have any vibration in it. Going now to the camera's bottom, we have the battery check off on button, and this allows you to check to see if your battery is good and turn your meter on and off. 
This way you can walk around without a lens cap on and it won't drain your battery. If you have it on, then your circuit's going to be on and it will continue to drain your battery if you have... Uh, actually, it'll, I think it'll drain your battery if you, even if you have a lens cap on it. Um, but it will drain it faster if you have a lens cap, if your lens cap is off. At any rate, if you're going to set your camera down for the night, you can just turn this to off and it won't drain your battery overnight. Tripod bushing. This is your battery chamber door. And as you can see, if you've seen other cameras, normally they have a slit in them. This does not. It just has a knurl, a diamond knurl. And uh, it's actually really easy to get the battery chamber open on these anyway. This is the film rewind button right here. This is what you push to, re to allow you to rewind the film when you're done with a roll. On the camera's back, we've got an ASA to DIN conversion chart. And actually on the SRT-101 that this replaced, you could rotate this, but it doesn't really make a big difference. DIN and ASA are the same. Uh, I mean, they're, they always line up the same way. DIN, DIN was an old German way of, write, of rating a film's speed, which speed being how, it, how quickly it reacts to light. And uh, ASA, which is the exact same thing as ISO, was the American way of doing it. I forget what DIN stands for, ASA, it was American Standard Association, ISO is International Standards Organization, and these are guys who know more about this stuff than I do, who decide what number should be associated with a film's sensitivity to light. We have the viewfinder up here, and the viewfinder has accessory grooves on it, you can see, so that you can put accessories in it, things like right angle fi finders, magnifying glasses, and so, so forth. And that's it. There is unfortunately no memo holder on the back. All right, so when we open up the back of the camera, here we have the film cassette chamber. This is where you'll put your film, your fresh film, when you want to go to shoot a roll of it. These are. Uh, this is a film guide pin, and there's another one up here. This helps to guide the film out of the chamber into the exposure area without it being becoming misaligned. These help keep it aligned properly. We have the film guide rails, these four dots on the outside and then these two rails on the inside. And what these four, four silver dots do is they help keep the film from moving up and down so that it slides through as it's supposed to. And the inside rails help keep it flat on plane with help from the film pressure plate, which we'll see in, in just a minute. This is the film tension sprocket right here. Oh, I forgot something. This is the shutter curtain right here. This is what opens to allow light to come in through your lens to hit your film. This is the film tension sprocket. And this keeps your film, uh, this keeps pressure on your film so that it stays flat on plane when you're taking photos. This is your film take up spool. And when you take a picture, you can see the shutter actuate right there. The film take up spool advances. On the films on the back door, not a whole lot. We just have the film pressure plate. As you can see, this camera's been used relatively little, based on the uh, si almost non-existent signs of wear on the uh, film pressure plate. And then a cassette spring as well on the right there. You can see the little U-shaped thing. That cassette spring helps keep the film cassette in place when it's in the camera body. Everything inside of the camera, basically, that you, that you can see, everything inside the camera that you can see serves one purpose, to keep the film flat on plane and to advance it smoothly through the camera. That's what it does. So some, some notes on the, uh, the SRT-102 before we, we close and before we go to some sample photos. Uh, as I said, some of the early bodies, the earlier SRT-102s had the MLU on them, the later ones didn't. I couldn't find exactly when the cutoff occurred for uh, for when MLU was taken out of the body and I don't know why it was uh, MLU is an important feature for for serious uh, pr pro grade photographers who want to who want to do very high quality things my, my suspicion is they took it out because the other SRTs weren't going to have MLU or something along those lines or the successor bodies weren't I'm not sure what uh, exactly what but the, the point of it, my suspicion is they took it out to simplify the manufacturing process and it's easier to manufacture things if they have more in common than if they, every one of them is different. 
So taking the MLU out probably allowed the components in the SRT-102 to be shared with the 101 and the other cameras. Minolta produced the first full aperture metering lens system. Uh, MC was their mount name, it stood for meter coupling, in the SRT-101 in 1966. The SRT-102 accepts MC and MD mount lenses, and when I say that they, they introduced the first full aperture metering system, what that means is that the lens here, this is a 58 millimeter 1 to 1.4. Looking through the viewfinder, unless you stop it down, it will always be at f1.4, so you will always see that through the viewfinder. However, if I set this to f5.6 or f16 or f anything other than 1.4, the camera will compensate and know what the correct exposure numbers should be in terms of shutter speed and aperture because it's, it can meter with the lens wide open and compensate in its body for the meter data. The CLC on the front means contrast light compensator and that CLC as we saw is right there under Minolta is short for it's an acronym for contrast light compensator and that's Minolta's name for the full aperture meter coupling. It has a fully mechanical shutter curtain so the battery only powers the meter. This camera can work with or without a battery. The only thing that doesn't function is the meter. Uh, as I said, it accepts MC and MD lenses. MD were the design that followed MC. This is actually an MD lens uh, that I have on here right now. The camera has one very major design flaw. Minolta used silk cord to connect the exposure needle to the aperture and shutter linkages. If you spin either of them too quickly, the silk cord can come off the internal rollers and the camera will require disassembly to function properly again. So basically, when adjusting your shutter speeds, you want to keep the shutter speed adjustment gentle. And the same thing with your aperture ring. I know that there are some photographers out there who have a tendency to just grab things and jerk them back and forth really quickly. And that is going to ruin this camera. You can still get them fixed, but it's not cheap. And uh, so it's better to preserve your camera in terms of its function by treating it a little bit gently. At the same time, <laughs> that's, that's a huge design flaw on Minolta's part. I, I'm kind of surprised that made it into, the, into production. At any rate, a few camera don'ts. In addition to don't spin those dials too quickly, do not touch the actual shutter curtain inside of the camera because you can brick your camera. Do not touch the mirror that's inside the mirror box because it's a surface coated mirror. So the silver is on the top and if your finger oils get onto that silver, it will cause the silver to tarnish or flake off and you will have a vastly diminished ability to take good photos based on what you see through your viewfinder. Do not, let your cam uh, do not leave your camera or lenses in your car because they'll get heat damage. Lenses have oil in them to help keep them moving smoothly and if it gets too hot it will get thin and get into the aperture blades and then when it cools down again it will get thick and the aperture blades won't stop down properly. Likewise cameras have oil in them to keep the mechanical components working and the same thing can happen. The oil can get into places it shouldn't and get thick again. Do not store your gear in a plastic bag or box. Uh, if you have, I keep my gear in a Pelican box, which is a big plastic box to be fair. Uh, I also keep desiccant packs, rechargeable desiccant packs. So that's the loophole there. But um, in general, don't just stash it in a plastic bag or put it in a box and put it on your shelf because moisture will get into that container and the fungus will grow. The fungus enjoys eating lens coatings and I've actually had one camera that I've seen where the fungus was growing on the viewfinder glass and it just had, looked like these big tall trees of fungus inside the viewfinder. It's actually really disgusting to look at. Don't let your camera get wet because even though these were advanced amateur and professional grade bodies, they didn't have weather sealing and water can get into them if, it's, if you get it in the rain and that will cause all kinds of creative and um, damaging havoc. In your, in your camera body. And just remember, your camera is a precision tool 
and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, it will take care of you. So now I'm going to say some thank yous and then we're going to go to sample photos. So thank you guys for watching. If this video was helpful, please leave me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track and that I'm producing content which is useful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about responding in a timely fashion. If you have suggestions, please let me know. And if I have the technical knowledge and the equipment, I'm more than happy to make those videos for you. If you'd like to subscribe, by all means, please do so. And then you'll find out when I have more photography and uh, digital and film related videos that are released. And one last thing. Thank you guys for watching. I've never really understood why Minolta flagged when Canon, Nikon, and Pentax survived, or what factors at Minolta led to their eventual retreat from the camera market. Losing a camera maker capable of putting together a gem like the SRT-102 is like losing a favorite uncle, even if you haven't seen him in many years. The SRTs weren't perfect, like that favorite uncle whose birthday gifts were what you liked four years ago. And after thinking about it some weeks, I think I know why Minolta faded away. The SRT's meter coupling can jam, the lens release feels chintzy, and the silk cords can come off their tracks if you move the dials too fast, and that's simply unacceptable in a high-end camera. And camera users will recognize those flaws, and they are significant flaws at that. So maybe the reason that, in the end, other companies survived is because they had better overall engineering and design controls. In 2012, two of my 20 best photos were taken with this camera on the same day. Selling it was a difficult choice. Seeing the box taken behind the post office counter was rather like seeing that favorite uncle's coffin lowered into the ground. And yes, it wasn't perfect, but Upon selling it, I wished I could have let it know that its quirks, like those gifts we would have loved our uncles to have given us four years earlier, were truly appreciated and loved.